I would say there are probably about four dead at this moment. Uh, I don't know what those are doing, whether they're alive or dead, but they seem to be very dead and they're thrown in. The detainment plates were developed in Belfast uh, for patients who were shot in the head and that was a combination of work between the dental surgeons and the neurosurgeons. Some of these people had perhaps a large chunk of their skull missing and something had to be done to protect the brain. There's a metal called titanium which is malleable, which is inert, doesn't cause infections. There was a dental consultant uh, called George Blair um, who used uh, an explosive technique to make upper dentures and George Blair had the idea of adapting that technique for skull defects and it really was quite perfect and uh, he did that work in association with a neurosurgeon called Derek Gordon. I remember in the ward seeing a young man on whom who had been shot in the head but he was now in rehab and he had this huge defect just covered by skin on the right hand side of his head. A defect you could put your fist into. And what happened to him then after a few months once his wounds had healed up and this titanium plate was put into his skull to give him back the contour and some semblance of normality. And that was one great advance made by the neurosurgeons in Belfast probably from 1974 onwards. And that's now, again, care and management of gunshot wounds of the head, which is now state-of-the-art all over the world. There was one particular injury that, that uh, we saw early in the Troubles, um, which then uh, was dealt with at a stroke almost, because if there was a bomb in or near a shop or any building with a lot of glass in it, um, we were getting people admitted with multiple horizontal cuts across their face and then eventually the penny dropped that what was happening was that this was the glass from the window on the other side of the street had been come flying across the street and it hit them and, and caused all these cuts. And then they started putting the adhesive plastic on the windows and although the window still disintegrated, the glass didn't fly across the street and that uh, injury then didn't happen anymore. My memories left me after Bloody Sunday and I still have blanks and actually nightmares yet. I wake up thinking about what happened. I actually was there when the shit was started and I blanked it out. But I remember treating one person in particular, which was a young boy called Michael Quinn. Uh, I think it was in Glenfada Park. And uh, he was shot running away from the power troopers. He was shot in the face and uh, I took him to the hospital. I got him in an ambulance, took him to Altena Gavin, and my friend greeted me that was in casualty, and she says, this is a nightmare, and I says, it's worse across the town. And uh, there were so much, so many people working casually. I says, I'd probably be better off across the town. So I went back. I spent the whole night there, and then I had to go to work the next day. So I had to get up from the first aid post and head down through the town, through the barricades and get on a bus to go to another home to change and get back into work again and not say a word to anybody about it. So that was the hard thing about it all. You couldn't really talk about it.
Do not fire back for the moment. Unless you identify a positive target. I was on the march as well, and I was in Russell Street because I had an old aunt that lived there, so I was sort of looking after her, and we were caught up in the shooting started. I could see the bodies lying at the, at the multi-story flats, so I took the blankets off my aunt's bread, and I took her with me and put her in front of me. She always said that I was a coward and used her as a shield. But in my head, I thought, they're not going to shoot an old woman. And we crossed the street and I covered over two of the bodies. They were both dead. Then I was treating people and I met up with one of the doctors from Mount McGovern and we were involved in going in to look at injured people. Dr. Soles was an anaesthetist in Mount McGovern. We were called into the next house and there was a young boy who was on the sofa and he had been shot on the tummy and Dr. Swords palpated his stomach and said, I think if we got this boy to the hospital he would live. And we put him in the back of the car and two men, one of the owner of the house and another man, drove the car and apparently only after Savile learned all those things that they came to the bridge and the army stopped them and arrested the two men and the young boy died in the back of the car. That was the first of the major disasters in Northern Ireland. So we learned first uh, and learned and to look at how we were going to deal with it when it ever happened again, which unfortunately it did. got a call to say there, there was a major incident and there was fire at the Lamon Hotel. And I made my way into the casualty in the Ulster Hospital not knowing what to expect. And uh, I was confronted with eight patients with, who had sustained varying degrees of severe burns, but they were all classified as major burns. Um, the, uh, one of the ambulance men at one stage asked me did I want to go and see some of the other people they'd brought in who hadn't made it, um, which I declined very definitely because I felt it enough to think about with the eight survivors. That was the, the first night, but in the ensuing weeks, uh, all the routine uh, work of the plastic surgery unit stopped and all time in the operating theatre was devoted to operating on these people who were severely burnt. Those eight people all survived, um, but I think some of them had a lot of difficulties. when it came to the likes of, of Grey Steel. That was just like clockwork, and it it's, sounds callous to be saying that, but at the change over the years from Bloody Sunday to then was dramatic. And the patients were in the operating theatres within an hour maybe of them being picked up by the ambulance and coming through casualty. And up having the whole four operating theatres that there was then, uh, working, calling in your staff, everybody that you called couldn't get in quick enough to, to help. The girl from maternity, who was the manager in maternity, came up to the main theatre doors and said to me, can I help? Uh, I didn't think much about it afterwards. I was thankful for her help. And then that's the first time, as I say, we were offered counselling and whatever, so many days later, and we were sitting around and the counsellor said, how do you feel and how did you feel and how did you deal with it? And when it came to me, I said, unfortunately, I was able to go to bed and sleep because I had learned to deal with it. And when it came to the girl from maternity, she said, I, I have had terrible sleep since because I never saw a gunshot wound.
So at the time of the Oma bomb, I was in Belfast um, and I was actually washing my mother's windows at the time and I had my pager because I was on call and my pager went off and I rang the hospital and they told me that the major incident plan had been initiated and I needed to respond. And I contacted the police anyway, they said, look, we'll, we'll escort you down. Um, and I think we made Dungan in 19 minutes that day. I've never, ever like driven like that. So by the time I arrived at South Throne, I couldn't, I, I couldn't, I could hardly stand. And it wasn't, uh, part of it was about what I was about to face, but the biggest part of it was just having driven like a maniac for, for that length of time. So we dealt with, um, I think in total around 36 or 37 casualties from that. Nothing compared to what Oma Hospital dealt with. They dealt with hundreds, nothing compared to what Enniskillen dealt with. But it gives you a sense of the enormity of that day. Um, I think all of our patients arrived, bar two, in cars and backs of lorries and trucks. Two came by ambulance. It was the one time in the whole history of my career at emergency care that Northern Ireland I felt had come close to, um, in terms of an emergency care response, um, being unable to respond totally. It was so overwhelming. So many people were injured, so many people were killed. One of our surgeons actually who had been, he was on holidays in Northern Ireland when he was on leave and he rang in and I said look my advice to you is to go straight to Oma and he operated into the early hours and right into the Sunday with other surgeons there and I remember saying to the staff if anybody rings in looking for information take your time with them on the phone. It's really important because it may be the only contact they'll have with healthcare professionals about their loved ones because if they're ringing us the chances are that their loved ones have been ba either badly injured or killed because they're obviously not in home and they're not in, in a skill um, and we did take our time and I, I, I took a few calls and I remember the screams at the other end of the phone when I was you know telling them that their loved ones were not with us and they were then making up their own minds that they obviously must be amongst the dead or missing. I remember one a girl came in, she, she was injured, um, and she was pregnant, and she was, um, she was admitted anyway. And a week later she delivered her baby. And I remember doing a, an interview, um, for, I think it was one of the newspapers, and, and I, I said something like, um, out of the darkness of Oma, of Oma, this is the first light, or something like that. I can't, you know, and this quote then was flashed all over. Um, and for me it was, you know, because, um, this woman had been injured herself. She could have easily been killed because the, the person, the individuals that she was speaking to at the time that the, the bomb went off were killed. She miraculously survived it, as did her unborn child. That was a really nice moment out of all of that week. You know, just a horrendous, horrendous time. I was going on to a set of night duty and I was going to be working about six nights in a row. By the time it came to the last night, I was counting down the hours to get a, a, a night off. But at about 11 o'clock that night, there was a call and it was to say that we, there'd been a bomb had gone off in Belfast and there was two critical casualties coming in from it. And I was uh, allocated to work in trauma resus with the second casualty. So um, he came in and he had uh, very, very bad wounds, very, really life-threatening wounds. The doctors, I mean, the doc doctors were amazing. They just did everything in their power to keep that person going, but he was deteriorating before our eyes. So we, um, there was nothing really could be done. And again, more casualties were coming in. So to give that person some respect, you know, theatre's such a busy place, to give them just, for the last moments of their life, some peace. I, um, all I could do 
was make sure that patient was covered in a clean blanket and that they were warm and they were comfortable for the last moments of their life. And I sat and held their hand. And I remember thinking that, you know, whoever done this to you, this person was about my age. I remember thinking, whoever done this to you, it's such a card that they would dare do something like this to another human being and leave them lying like this. So the person died. And his death was dignified in the end because I made sure it was. One night in particular was really horrific. We came into a bomb explosion. We came into shootings. Uh, they were all coming into casualty. We, we worked all night. We were, it was unbelievable. But then another big explosion came on earlier in the morning and our place was just absolutely packed. And fair play to all the doctors that came down to help and all the senior nurses, night sisters. Uh, we, we seemed to manage. Not, I don't know what trauma left everybody with, but we did manage. We went into the kitchen to get a wee cup of tea, and the, the wee domestic had made us a cup of tea. And we were all sitting, we started to talk about what happened. And then this went on for about a half an hour. And then all of a sudden, there's a wee voice says, well dearies, did you do enough? And I looked round, and there was the wee domestic, the wee lady who made us the tea. And I says, I looked at everybody, I says, yeah, I think we did. And everybody says, yeah, we did our best. That was our counselling for all our years casually. We talked it out between each other. I'm not sure that we coped. I think we muddled by. It was um, your colleagues really that, that you know, they were very perceptive of your needs and your of them, so we were our own support network there. Um, but really, you know, it was very difficult to go home from a shift and relax because there'd been so much going on and there was so much adrenaline. Um, it was very hard to wind down. We should have the support and it wasn't, wasn't okay, you know, to move on from one instance to the next um, without having any sort of support or, or, or an opportunity just to talk about how you were feeling. Um, and I suppose maybe that was a difficulty too, because you did move from one incident to the next, and quite often there wasn't the time even to think about, you know, the last incident. We got off today very late, and I just remember sitting in the canteen afterwards, and one of the third year nurses that was had been on the ward with me, I remember her coming over and saying, you're very white, are you okay? And I just remember saying, I'm fine, I'm fine. And that's what everybody said after anything, just that you were fine, because my whole concern then was, I hope I don't sleep in the next morning because how am I going to face the ward sister if I sleep in? Whenever an incident occurred in, in, in Belfast, everybody pulled it together. There was a tremendous amount of cooperation and goodwill amongst the staff. Nobody looked at their watch. There was no saying, I've got to go home, I've got to do this, I've got to do that. Uh, people that really didn't even have any skills in, in resuscitation and trauma appeared to see if they could be of any help. So we became a very close community. And the whole team in Bedlam, I include the ambulance men, the nurses, Doctors of all description, young and older, uh, worked together. We got to know each other well, because there's no life outside. You might remember in, towards the middle and the end of the 70s. And I thought that this is going to sound like a tremendous paradox. It was a very happy environment. It was a very close environment and a very collegiate environment, despite the madness that was going on outside. When you look back at a lot of the incidents with the troubles, you sort of think, you know, how, you know, how did you work through that? Or, and certainly it wouldn't now that you experience peace for so long, you just not, would not want any of your colleagues to be having to work through all of that again. But I loved my job as a nurse, no matter what I did. 
it's really very surreal now looking back on it because it seems like such a long time ago but there are things as I say that you never ever forget um, I think yeah they were scary sometimes but having said all that I remember being on days off and I couldn't wait to get back to work because I enjoy, enjoyed my job so much. Um, a mixture of emotions, one is sadness, you know, why did it have to happen, did it, did it have to last for a full 40 years, so we have that degree of sadness uh, if one looks back. At the same time we made advances, we gave good uh, care to the patients and if you did a job well many survived severe life-threatening injuries that would not have survived in other conflicts and there was a buzz, yeah. There was a buzz.